Go ahead and raise your hand and we'll try to get you a bulletin. And you may want to follow along. There's an outline of today's sermon. Uh, we have a, someone over here who needs a bulletin. There's an outline of today's sermon. You can fill in the blanks as I go along or you can use it to play tic-tac-toe or draw pictures, whatever you want. And on the back side, there's all the scripture I'm going to use. And I may not use it all, but you'll have a reference of it corresponding to the Pew Bible under the seat in front of you. There's a page number, so uh, hopefully you can follow along as, as, as I go along. Uh, how many of you know Mickey Mantle? Have ever heard of Mickey Mantle? Well, quite, quite a few of you. Uh, he's a New York Yankees Hall of Famer, and he once told of a story where he struck out three times every time he went to bat. He struck out three times in a row in one game. And he said he went to the locker room afterwards, and he was just so despondent. He put his face in between his his hands, and he was on the verge of tears. And then about that time, he heard some footsteps coming towards him. So he looked up, and it was his son, little son, Timmy Barra. And he thought his son was going to come and give some encouraging words like, you know, hang in there, Dad. Don't feel bad. But all he said, all he did was look at me and say, you stink. (laughs) <laughs> from, the mouth of, from the mouth of babes. I want to ask you this morning, when it comes to the Christian walk, have you ever felt like you stink? Have you ever felt like a failure in, in, in the Christian walk? You know, most of the heroes we look up to in the Bible today, at one time, they stunk. They really messed up bad in their Christian walk, but, but you know what? They didn't quit, just like Mickey Mantle didn't quit. And I want to look at a, a, one of my favorite characters in the Bible today. If there's anyone in the Bible I identify with, it's Peter. Peter was impetuous, and that's, you know, he, he, he was bold in his faith for the Lord, and, you know, but he made a lot of stupid mistakes. He said a lot of things he shouldn't have, have said, so I, I, I want to look at Peter. Now, understand something. This is what we're going to look at, we're going to start with this one passage, and then we're going to back up, and then I'm going to go forward, and then I'm going to fill in the middle. You all tracking? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I'm looking at the, the end passage. This is two years after Jesus called him into the, the ministry to be fishers of men. In Luke chapter 5, he says, drop what you're doing, follow me. You're, now going to, you're not going to fish for fish anymore. You're going to be fishers of, of men. And for, for, for over two years, Peter faithfully followed Jesus Christ, faithfully serving Jesus Christ. But now we read in John, this passage we're going to look at in John, in fact, if you want to look there, John 21, verse 3, John 21, verse 3. Now what we look at in this passage is Peter gave up. Peter quit being a Christian. He says, you know what? I stink at being a Christian. I give up. I can't do this anymore. So you know what Peter did? He went back to fishing. Isn't that what we do when we give up on Christ? Isn't that what we do when we quit our Christian walk? Is we go back to what we used to do. And that's what Peter's doing now. He says, you know what? I, I give up. I can't do this anymore. So let's look at verse uh, chapter 21, verse 3, page 1653 in your pew Bible. Are you with me? Peter says, I'm going out to fish. I give up. Simon Peter told them, and they said, hey, we're going with you. We're we're going with you. He left the ways of Christ. He went back to Galilee, went fishing. He felt like a failure. But what knocked Peter out of the race? Peter was running a good race, wasn't he? He was serving the Lord very well. What caused him to go back to his old way of life? I'm glad you asked that. Look at Luke chapter 22, page 1605 in your pew Bible. Luke 22 Page 1605 in your pew Bible. Starting in verse 31. Simon, Simon. Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. 
Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times that you know me. Skip down to verse 54. Then seizing him, Jesus, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. But when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard, I guess it was cold out, and they all sat down together, and Peter sat down with them, and a servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, Hey, wait a minute. This man here, he's, he was with Jesus. Verse 57, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, Hey, aren't you also one of them, those followers of Jesus? And he said, Man, I am not. Peter replied, verse 59, about an hour later, another asserted, hey, certainly this fellow was with him, for he's a Galilean. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. Would you pray with me? Father, Lord, I thank you for all those who are here this morning. And Father, I know that they're here for a reason. To hear this message that you have laid on my heart to proclaim to them. Use me as your instrument this morning, your vehicle, your weapon. Speak through me, Father. Give me your words to proclaim. And Father, touch the hearts and minds of everyone who is here today. May you use this message, Father, to encourage us, to draw us near to you, to help us to, to realize that, that failure is just not final with you. So, Father, bless this time. Into your hands I commit this time. May you remove any distractions from this place, remove any distractions from our minds, and let us just focus on you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, reading about P Peter's failure following Christ, I want to notice two things. Number one, the causes of of failing Jesus Christ. What caused Peter to fail? And number one, Satan works against us and we let him. Satan works against us. Satan is behind all temptations. Satan is behind all temptations to lead us away from Christ, to get us to do our, our, our own thing. You see, as the cross drew near, Satan was stepping up his attacks against Jesus and, and his disciples. And Jesus warned them that they needed to be ready. In verse 31, Jesus said, Simon, Simon, and he's referring to, to Peter here, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. Now the you here in this, in this passage here is plural. So in Texas, it could be translated like, Satan has asked to sift all y'all, all y'all as wheat. So he's talking to Peter but he's addressing all y'all, all yeah, all, all disciples. And you know what? Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you are not exempt from Satan trying to sift you as wheat. 1 Peter 5.8 says, Satan roams the earth like a lion looking whom he can devour. Satan wants to sift you as wheat. So as we look at Jesus' words, we can learn three things about Satan's attacks. Number one. Satan wants to sift us as wheat. Verse 31. Uh, now, when a farmer harvests wheat, he would, he would bring the wheat to the threshing floor, and he would beat the wheat on, on the floor. Gary, can you show that quick video? This is not a real exciting video, but it gives you an idea what threshing wheat is like. Okay? Not exciting. But do you get an idea what sifting wheat is like, though? Do you get an idea? Imagine you're, you're that, that wheat there. And Jesus said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. He has asked to, to pound you. He wants to pound you. He wants to separate you from, from Christ. He, he wants to, to discourage you. He wants to, to, to harm you. Uh, pound you. He wants to pound you emotionally. He wants to pound you physically. He wants to pound you spiritually. Satan wants to sift you as wheat. Do you understand that, Simon?
I want to point something out to you. 52% of Christians in a Barna survey said they don't believe that the devil is real. Listen, people. Jesus said Satan is alive and he wants to sift you as wheat. Now, if he can get you to believe that he's not, how can you go through this world and see the evil and not think Satan is real? And that's one of his tactics. If he can get you to believe he's not real, then you're not worried about him. There's two improper views you can have of the devil. One is that you see him behind every bush. And the other is that you don't see him at all. And he would just assume that you don't see him at all because that way you're not, you're not defensive. You're, you're not even worried about him. But Jesus said, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, I have come so that you may have life and have it abundantly, but the thief, Satan, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. There's Satan's plan for your life right there. Let's look at B. Satan is limited in what he can do. Verse 31, he says, Satan has asked. There's only one other time in the Bible that I know of where Satan had to ask to attack one of God's servants. Where is that? What book? In Job. In Job. In Job chapter 1, verse 10, it says, The Lord has a hedge of protection around those who are his. And then in verse 12, it says, The Lord allows Satan to tempt and test Job, but he couldn't lay a finger on him. You see, Satan is restricted by God. Well, that begs the question, why restrict Satan? Why not just get rid of him? Look at all the trouble he's causing in this world. One day, Jesus will. I believe it is in Revelation 21, when Satan is judged and cast into the, the lake of fire and all those who followed him. One day, Satan, Jesus will, God will put an end to Satan. But until that time, God uh, allows Satan, in fact, he's ruler of this world, 1 John 5 uh, 18 through 21 says Satan is the ruler of this world. This world is under the control of the evil one. So he allows Satan to, to be in control of this world. So why not do away with evil? Well, if God did away with evil, would you have a choice between good and evil? Would you have a choice to obey God or disobey God? No, you wouldn't. And God wants us to be able to choose to obey him. You see, all of the evil things we see in this world are, are, are choices by people who made to disobey God. And Satan will work in through them. How many of you ever encountered a, a dog on a chain, a vicious dog on a chain? Anybody? <clears throat> What'd you do? Did you, did you walk into the dog's territory? No. But could that dog harm you as long as he was on that chain? No, he couldn't. Understand something. When, when you step out of God's will, you're stepping into Satan's territory. Do you understand that? You're stepping into his territory. So God may allow things to happen to maybe test your faith, to draw you back to him. And in this case, in Peter, we're going to look at why God allowed Peter to be uh, uh, basically attacked by Satan. But we do know this. Romans 8, 28 says, God works good out of all things for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. I'm standing here today as a testimony. Jeff Roman has been beaten and sifted and pounded by the devil. I have. I've been through the ringer. Can I hear an amen? amen. Some of you have been through sifted and beaten and through the, the, the ringer as well. But I can say this. God works good out of all things for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. The third thing is we work against ourselves. Verse 31, Jesus warned Peter about Satan's attacks, did he not? And, man, this is where I identify with Peter so much. In verse 31, he warns Peter. And what's Peter's response in verse 33? You know, Lord, no, 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 Lord, you talking to me? Lord, you, you got me confused with these other guys. They may fail you. I'm not going to fail you, Lord. In fact, I'm going to go with you to, to death. Peter could talk a good game, couldn't he? Yeah. He could talk a good game. But when it came down to it, he failed the Lord miserably. You know, sometimes, this is where I think we all can identify with Peter. We may have good intentions. We may say, Lord, not me, Lord. There's no way I'm ever going to do that again. I'm, I'm done with that only to find ourselves weeping bitterly. 
Feeling like Peter, rejected and dejected, knowing we failed him again. We failed him again. And Peter failed the Lord miserably because Peter was trying to stand in his own strength. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus told the disciples, pray and watch that you don't fall into temptation. He came back an hour later. What were they doing? Sleeping! Ephesians 6, we're told to pray and we're told to put on the armor of God. You cannot stand and walk through this Christian uh, life by yourself. If we try it by ourselves, we're going we're gonna to stink. We're going to stink every time. We can't do it. We're going to fail the Lord every, every time, right? You know why? Because Satan never takes a holiday. He never takes a day off. Do you know that? And as a Christian, you should never take a day off. You always got to be vigilant. Keep your, keep your guard up. Put on the full armor of God. So the two causes of spiritual warfare are Satan and ourselves. Now let's look for the cure. The cure for when we fail Jesus. Number two, Jesus is working for us. Look at verse Luke twenty two thirty two. 32. But I have prayed for you that your faith would not fail. Jesus is interceding on our behalf. Do you know that? Jesus is praying on our behalf. He assures us he's in our corner. I want you to notice something. Jesus did not pray, Peter, I pray that you will not have to go through this trial. He didn't pray that. He said, Peter, I pray that your faith will not fail as you go through this trial. You see, what was more important to the Lord was not that Peter be delivered from all trials in life, but that Peter would have the faith to see him through the trials of life. Your faith is precious to the Lord. In fact, in John 17, 15, Jesus says, my, and speaking to us, praying for believers, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one, that we have the faith to make it through this world. So looking at Jesus' prayer, I, he said, Peter, I have prayed for you that your faith would not fail. Looking at what happened, what, what's Peter doing now? What's, where is he? Where is he? Fishing! He gave up on his Christian lifestyle. So Jesus' prayer seems to have gone unanswered. Wait a minute. Jesus prayed that his faith would not fail, and we're reading here in John that his faith failed. Peter has given up the, the Christian life. He says, I'm going back to fishing. So it would appear that Jesus' prayer was ineffective, wouldn't it? Ah, how many of you ever hear of Paul Harvey? Now you're going to hear the rest of the story. If you would, turn to Acts chapter 3, verse 41, page 1659 in your pew Bible. Remember, I told you I was starting at the end, then I was going to go to the beginning, then I was going to go to the end again and then fill in the middle. So now we're looking at the end, Peter. Let, let me set the stage, okay? There's a different Peter that has emerged on the scene now. Peter didn't drop out of the race, and we're going to see why in just a minute. I'm going to fill in the blanks in just a minute. But what we see here now is a Peter that is greatly used by the Lord. Thousands, in his first sermon, thousands are one to Christ. In his second sermon, thousands are one to Christ. The Sanhedrin hear about him. They hear that he's preaching about Christ and the resurrection. So they call uh, uh, Peter before them, and they say, Peter, you better shut up. We don't want to hear about this Jesus anymore, because if we hear anything else about this Jesus... We're going to do the same thing to you as we did to Jesus. Do you understand us, Peter? So I set the scenario. So let's read what's, what's going on. In Acts 3.41, his first sermon, 3,000 are saved. Look at Acts 4, verse 1 through 4. How many are saved there? Grew to about what? How many? 5,000. Now look at Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Peter is now before the Sanhedrin, the same ones who put Jesus to death. And he says, salvation is found in no one else. 
There is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. And it says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Just pause right there. I wonder how many people look at our lives and take note that we have been with Jesus. Can they see that we have been with Jesus? Do they see any difference in our lives? I pray that they do. I pray they can see Christ in us and all that we say and all that we do. Verse 18. Then they called them in again. And they said, do not speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. And I love Peter and John, how they replied. Hey, dudes. Judge for yourselves whether we should obey you or God. For we can't help but speak about what we have seen and what we have heard. Wow. Is this the same Peter who gave up on the faith? So you see, Jesus' prayer was answered, wasn't it? Peter's faith did not fail. He had a time of testing. He had a time where he was discouraged and he just gave up and he thought, I stink at this, I give up, I quit. But what do you account for the change in Peter's life? Why did he change? Why did, why, what made him become such a bold servant for Christ that he could stand there before the Sanhedrin and say, you know what, you guys, you can do what you want to me. You can kill me. But I must speak about Christ. I must obey God over men. Now, this is the same Peter, I want you to remember, who denied Christ three times. But now there's a transformation and this is, this is really the, the crux of, of what I want to get to. Turn to John 21, page 1653 in the Pew Bible. Now, I, I want you to remember, Jesus said, Peter, I'm praying for you that your faith would not fail. Do you remember that? Now, how, how would it make you feel? Do you, do you all know that we have a prayer room right back here? Do you all know that? It's a beautiful prayer room. In fact, if you want to get into the prayer room, let us know. There's a code on the outside door. You don't even have to enter the church. And you can come in that prayer room anytime and pray. But what if I told you this? Jesus is in there right now praying for us. He's in there right now praying for, for you and me that our faith would not fail. How would that make you feel? And I'm here to tell you, you know, you know what do you think Jesus is doing now in heaven since he ascended? Do you, what do you think he's doing? Been doing all that time. You know what he's doing? He's praying for you. He's praying for you. Just as he's praying for Peter that his faith would not fail, he's praying for you and me. Uh, uh, keep your place there in John and turn to uh, Romans 8.34, please. Page 1719 in your pew Bible. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God doing what? Interceding for us, you and me. Jesus is praying for you right now. Yes, he's in that prayer room right now praying for you. He's praying that your faith would not fail. You may be going through a time of testing right now. And Jesus is saying, don't give up. Don't quit. You may think, man, I stink at being a Christian. Don't give up. Don't quit. Because we're going to look at what transformed Peter's life here in a second. Look at B. Jesus is giving us grace. Jesus is giving us grace. Look, at, look back. Oh, gosh, I took you to John already, didn't I? I'm going to read to you. Stay there in John. I'll just read to you Luke twenty two thirty two, 32. And it says, And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. So Jesus knew that Peter was going to fail, didn't he? And he says, Peter, when you turn back, not if, when you turn back, I want you to know I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to restore you, Peter. And then I want you to strengthen your brothers. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that an amazing testimony of God's grace? And I imagine God telling each and every one of us here, I want to take you back. He says, yeah, your, your faith may have failed. You may think you stink at being a Christian, but I, I'm going to take you back. I want you back. Please come back. 
And that's where we lead up to John. So that's where you should be right now. Are you there? Well, let's fill in C in your handout first. I'm sorry, I'm all over the place, aren't I? I get ahead of myself. C in your handout. He invites us back to the table of mercy. He invites us back to the table of mercy. So do you remember where Peter was in this story? We picked it up. Verse 3, are you there? 21-3. Peter had failed the Lord miserably. He wept bitterly over, over, over disowning Jesus, denying Jesus. And now verse 3, he says, I'm going out to fish. Are you there? Simon Peter told them, and they said, we're going to go with you. So they went out, got into the boat that night, but they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your nets on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, who's that? John, said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped out his armor garment around him for he'd taken it off and he jumped into the water. And the other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed there, they saw a fire burning coals there with fish on it. Just pause there for a minute. Do you remember what was the scenario? What was the context where Jesus denied Peter? What was going on? What was he, what was he standing around? A fire. So I think it's interesting now Jesus has a fire going where he's going to restore Peter back to him, right? He has a fire burning with coals with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish. That tells me Peter was strong. There was, there was a lot of fish in there, I think 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Can I pause right here for a minute? And I, I have to explain something. I love cookies. I love cookies. I'm a cookie-holic. In fact, I'm an I, I ex-cookie-holic. I'm Cookie Eaters Anonymous now. But I, I love motorcycles. I love riding my motorcycle. In fact, we've got a ride next Monday, any of you want to go. <laughs> Brian, you still on? Good. I love my wife. I love my wife. Now, can I possibly put cookies in the same category as my wife? I hope not, yeah. <laughs> you see, but in our English language, we only have one word for love, and we use it to describe everything, from cookies to the love that we have from our, uh, our wives or, or our children. In the Greek language, there's three different words for the word love. There's agape love. And this is the highest form of love that you can have. It's a sacrificial love. And studying a little bit further, and this is where it makes sense. This passage makes sense to me now. It's also a word that was used to describe from a, from a uh, 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 I don't want to say in, a subordinate to uh, like a commanding officer. That you were pledging loyalty and allegiance and obedience to this, to this superior. And that was a word that you would use, agape. So it's, it's, it's interesting. You've got to keep this in mind as we go through this passage, okay? That's agape. Everyone understand what agape love is? Then there's phileo love. And phileo is just a friendship love. Yeah, you know, I love you, man. Yeah, you know, that's a, just a, a, a friendship love that we have. And then there's uh, eros, where we get the word erotic type, type love. So they have three Greek words describing love. So what's my point in all this? I just wanted to dazzle you with my knowledge of Greek. <laughs> no. Let's look back at the passage now, and it'll make some sense, okay? Verse 15. When he had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you agape love me? 
More than these? And we don't know what more than these are. It could be his fishing business, because he went back to fishing. It could be his disciples. We don't know what more than these are. Maybe all his worldly possessions. Do you love me more than all your worldly possessions? And he says, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo, phileo love you. Interesting. Jesus asked, do you agape love me? And Peter says, Lord, you know I phileo love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said to Simon, son of John, do you agape love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know I phileo love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you phileo love me? Peter was hurt because he asked him a third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things, you know that I phileo love you. Feed my sheep. So what's the, what's the big deal? The big deal is this. If I, uh, I feel if I could put a hinge on my sermon, this is the turning point in Peter's life right here. Prior to this, Peter was a bold man, a strong man. We know he was strong. He pulled in that whole net of fish by himself. So I, I imagine Peter, prior to this point here, relied on Peter. Relied on what he could do. And this is where I identify with Peter so much. But Peter was no match for Satan. As big and as strong as Peter was, he was no match for a devil who wanted to sift him as wheat. And Peter went through the ringer. He went through a time where he thought he stunk. He went through a time where he felt rejected. He went through a time where he just quit the Christian life. He went back to his old way of life. He quit. He's a failure. This is bold, proud Peter who says, Lord, I'll never, I'll never quit on you. Wow, what a humbling experience Peter went through. So now the Lord asked him, Peter, do you agape love me? And I think Peter's response here shows his humility. Shows he, he can't stand there after, after seeing the Jesus that he rejected. He can't stand there and say, Oh, yes, Lord, I agape love you. He can't say that, can he? He said, oh, Lord, I, I imagine he's just put his head down. Lord, I phileo love you. I can't say I agape love you. Not the way I treated you. Not the way I deserted you. Not the way I, I, I rejected you, denied you. I can't stand here and say I, I agape love you. And he asked him again. And it, it said that he asked him three times because Jesus denied him. Um, Peter denied him three times. So he asked him three times. And then finally, Jesus said, do you phileo love me? Peter says, yeah, that's where I'm at. That's where I'm at, Lord. I can't boast. I have nothing to boast about. Lord, in my heart, I want to agape love you. But I can't because my actions dictate otherwise because I have failed you, Lord. And I believe, it doesn't say this, but I believe Jesus put his hand on Peter on that third one. And it was like, do you phileo love me? In other words, it's all right, Peter. It's all right, Peter. I forgive you. I want to restore you. I want to have fellowship with you again. I invite you back to have fellowship with me again. Your phileo love is good enough for me right now. And I'm here to tell you that day, Peter, bold, proud, strong Peter who failed the Lord, he experienced grace mercy, and forgiveness. And once he experienced God's grace, mercy, and forgiveness, no longer was it about, oh, strong Peter. Now it was about humble Peter, who, who received God's grace and mercy, who just wants to serve the Lord. And now he's standing before the Sanhedrin and says, you can do whatever you want to me. I will not deny my Lord Jesus again. Amen. You see, this is someone who now has agape love. He now has agape love, but it didn't happen overnight. You know how it happened? Hear me, please hear me. It happened because he failed. Do you understand that? It happened because he failed Jesus. So I don't know where you're at right now. Maybe you failed Jesus and you think it's over and you're going back fishing. But I'm here to tell you the Lord is inviting you back. And he says, it's okay, I'll take your phileo love. And once you experience his love, his grace, his mercy, you will be transformed. 
And you, you will want to live for Christ. And no longer will you be standing in your power and your strength, but you will be standing in the Lord's power and in His strength. And that's where Peter messed up. He thought he could do this Christian thing in his own power and strength. Now, what's, what's interesting is why did Jesus offer Peter a meal? Was he a Baptist and he liked to eat? Do you know that in the Bible, you know what a meal symbolizes in the Bible? Look at Revelation 3.20, if you would. Page 1871 in your pew Bible. Jesus is standing outside the door of the church at Laodicea. A church that had grown lukewarm, had strayed from from him. And Jesus is standing outside the door saying, Hey, I want to come in, church. Will you let me in? And this is used for individual believers, too. And I'm okay with that, that Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart. That's okay. I'll go with that. But what does Jesus say he will do if you will open up the door? I will come in and sup with you. I will come in and dine with you. I'll come in and eat with you. I will come in and fellowship with you. You know what that's symbolic of? It's symbolic of forgiveness. It's symbolic of reconciliation. It's symbolic of restoration. Why is Jesus cooking Peter a meal? Man, this is symbolic. Peter, I'm forgiving you. I'm reconciling you. I'm calling you back to myself. We're going to eat together. Do you understand? We're getting ready to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And I want you to look at this as fish. Jesus is inviting you back to him today. He's saying, I don't don't care what you have done. My blood will cover it. I don't care where you have been. I will forgive you. Do you understand that? Your failure is not final with Jesus Christ. He is inviting you to the table this morning. The bread symbolizes his body that was sacrificed on the cross for you. The juice symbolizes his blood that was shed for you. He's inviting you back. Where where are you today? Some of you need to receive forgiveness for the first time. Some of you need to, to accept what God has done for you on the cross. Some of you, maybe you feel like, you know what, I've failed the Lord so bad There's no way he can take me back. I'm just going to keep fishing. That's a lie straight from hell. Jesus is inviting you back today. Failure is not final with Jesus Christ. If you don't remember anything from this sermon, you remember that. Failure is never final with Jesus Christ. He is inviting you back to fellowship with him this morning. We're going to have a time of invitation. And this is your opportunity to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. Maybe join this church, follow through in baptism. And then after the the, the invitation, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And if you need to leave, that's fine. If you want to stay and break bread with the Lord, as he's inviting you to do, then then I encourage you to to stay. But let's have a time of prayer first. Father, I just thank you, Father, that you don't treat us as our sins deserve. And Father, you invite us to drink from your cup today. You invite us to to eat of your body, to experience fellowship with you again, to know that our, our past sins, our past transgressions have been forgiven. And it doesn't matter where we've been, what we have done, you invite us to come back to you today. Lord, if we ever doubt your love, let us remember the cross, how you died on the cross for our sins. And failure is where we learn to be victorious. Failure is where we learn your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness. And failure is never final with you, Lord. So, Father, let us get back up and get back to work. Let us get back up to to serving you again, to feeding your sheep, to be fishers of men and women. Because failure is never final. Father, if there's someone here today who doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, I pray that this would be the day. I pray that they could be restored by 
by you today. I pray that they would cry out to you, Lord, I need you, I want you, I want to trust you as my Lord and Savior. Because you can't experience God's strength and victory until you do. So Father, into your hands I commit this time of, of invitation. Your word says that your word will not fall to the ground. So Father, use this message to draw us nearer to you. Help us to be obedient to your will to restore us back to a right relationship with you or just to, to encourage us and strengthen us, Father Lord, knowing we have such an awesome Savior who prays for us that our faith would not fail. Father, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.